Managing hypertension is a huge part of GP's workload. Um, it's said to account for 12% of consultations, so it's more than one in 10 people that we see. My name is Mary Harding. I'm a portfolio GP in Hertfordshire. I'm a medical author, senior appraiser, and clinical complaints advisor. But most relevant to this topic is I've been a GP for 25 years, and we are the experts in managing hypertension. We manage blood pressure on a daily basis, and hypertension is almost entirely managed by primary care. The previous NICE guidelines for hypertension were in 2011, and since then there has been a lot of evidence, more evidence about the benefits of treating high blood pressure, even at the lower levels, and other international guidelines and organisations have recommended different treatment thresholds. The aim of the guidelines is to reduce the risk of devastating cardiovascular events such as heart attacks and strokes by um, enabling health professionals to accurately diagnose hypertension and treat it effectively. So the bottom line for me about what's new in these guidelines is that really I as a GP need to consider treating pretty much everybody who's got blood pressure uh, over 140, over 90. Hypertension is a major risk factor for mitocardial infarction, for stroke, for chronic kidney disease, for cognitive decline, heart failure and premature death. So globally about a quarter of the population have hypertension. A study in England in 2015 uh, showed a prevalence of 31% in men and 26% in women. Uh, that goes up to almost half, over half of the population over the age of 60 have hypertension, so it's a huge problem. Uh, it accounts for 12% of GP consultations, more than one in 10 of the people that we're seeing. Usually hypertension is asymptomatic, mostly we pick it up on routine testing. Um, sometimes it presents with uh, symptoms of end organ damage, such as people presenting with angina or visual problems, or occasionally acute events such as heart attacks or TIAs or strokes. So the guideline starts off with uh, reminding us how to accurately measure blood pressure, um, in particular if somebody has uh, an irregular pulse such as atrial fibrillation then we shouldn't be using automated devices because it might not be accurate. Secondly it reminds us to check the blood pressure on both arms when diagnosing. If that difference is more than 50 millimeters of mercury then check it again and if it's still a difference between the two arms of more than 15 millimeters of mercury then uh, always use the arm that had the higher blood pressure. If you take blood pressure and it's more than 140 over 90, then check it again. Um, and if there's a significant difference, then check it a third time. Then use the lower of those last two readings and measure that as your clinic blood pressure. If it is still over 140 over 90, that's the magic number to remember in your head, that's hypertension if it's higher than that, 140 over 90. If it's higher than 140 over 90, then uh, offer ambulatory blood pressure measuring. You need 14 readings at least in waking hours. So when you look at the results, uh, you have to look at the daytime or the waking hours readings, not the nighttime ones, and you average, average those, and that becomes your ambulatory blood pressure. If that isn't available or isn't suitable or the patient can't tolerate it, uh, then we can use home blood pressure monitoring. And if people are going to do that, they have to do two readings. Um, at least a minute apart, twice a day, and they should do that for at least four, but ideally seven days. And then having got those readings, they discard the first day altogether and take an average of the rest of the readings, and that becomes the, the average home blood pressure reading. Most importantly, you want to put together a Q-Risk2, which is an assessment of somebody's cardiovascular risk, risk of having a cardiovascular event over the next 10 years. It'll include so blood tests for lipids, for renal function, and for HbA1c. You need to check the fundi, uh, arrange for an ECG, uh, ask the person to provide a sample of urine, um, which you will dip for blood and then send off to the lab for an ACR uh, albumin creatinine ratio. We would confirm diagnosis of hypertension if the clinic blood pressure is over 140-90 and the um, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring or home blood pressure monitoring averages are 135 over 85 or more. Um, if the readings are, do not fulfill those criteria, then you send them away and can check their blood pressure every five years 
unless they're at higher risk. So if they've got diabetes or if the readings were closer to the threshold, then you would uh, bring them back at least annually to measure it again. So once hypertension has been diagnosed, um, NICE classifies it into stage one, two and three um, in order to guide treatment. If it's very high, that becomes stage three. So if a systolic blood pressure is over 180 and the diastolic is over 120, that becomes stage three and the um, rules are different. Um, stage two begins at 150 over 95 or more uh, and stage one is from 135, 85 up to that. So the most important thing is to explain about high blood pressure, explain about the implications, explain about the benefits of, of treatment and then uh, they can make an informed decision about what, what they want to do and whether they want treatment. Um, and if you get them on board then they're much more likely to adhere to the, the, the treatment plan. Um, Everybody who's been diagnosed with hypertension, we should be giving lifestyle advice to, and then we should um, reinforce that on a regular basis thereafter. Um, anybody under the age of 40 with hypertension, we should uh, seek specialist review. We need to break it down into the, the three stages. Uh, I'm going to deal with stage two first because that's the easiest. Anybody with stage two hypertension, offer them treatment irrelevant of their age, um, offer them treatment. The only uh, exception to that is people with frailty or multimorbidity, in which case NICE recommends we use our clinical judgment. Somebody with stage one hypertension with a Q risk score of 10% or more, um, we should consider treatment. Also anybody who has diabetes or who has uh, end stage organ damage uh, or has established cardiovascular disease. In addition, uh, people who are under 60 but actually have a 10 year cardiovascular risk score uh, of less than 10%, we should consider treating them too because they, uh, their 10 year risk score probably underestimates their overall lifetime risk uh, and therefore there's a high chance that they will benefit from treatment as well. So bottom line, think about it in everybody with stage one hypertension. Stage three hypertension is when the systolic blood pressure is uh, over 180 uh, or the diastolic uh, blood pressure is over 120. And in that situation, um, we previously, under the previous guidelines, would have referred them for immediate specialist review. But under the new guidelines, we don't need to refer everybody immediately for specialist review. However, we should do so if they have um, papilledema or retinopathy, or if they have any acute symptoms such as confusion or chest pain or failure, uh, or if, we can, if we're suspecting theochromocytoma. Um, but if none of those apply, then we can repeat the blood pressure within seven days. And if it's still up at those high levels, then we just go straight to treatment and we don't need to arrange ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. So the target we're aiming for is 140 over 90 or below. Uh, other than if the person is over 80, in which case the target is 150 over 90 or below. The next question is which medication we treat with and NICE gives us a four step process. Um, and thankfully that hasn't actually changed significantly. So we're already quite used to dealing with most of this. So um, the first step uh, is to use a calcium channel blocker for most people, unless they're under 55, or they have diabetes, in which case you're going to go straight to an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. So that's your step one. Um, if it is, if they don't tolerate the calcium channel blocker, uh, then the alternative would be a thiazide-like diuretic, particularly indapamide. Um, and you would also use indapamide first line for somebody that had failure, um, as, alongside referring them as, as per usual for further investigation. So step two, um, first, first thing is to check that they're taking the medication, uh, check for adherence, that they're not getting any side effects, that they're taking it correctly. But if that's the case and the blood pressure remains above target, then you go on to step two, which is adding another drug, 
So for those people that were on a calcium channel blocker, um, you can now offer them the choice of their second drug, and that could be an ACE inhibitor, an ARB, uh, or a thiazide-like diuretic, such as indapamide. Um, for the people that were already on the ACE or the ARB, you're going to offer them the choice of a calcium channel blocker or a thiazide diuretic, like a indapamide. Um, if they're of um, Afro-Caribbean origin and they're taking, uh, you're choosing between an ACE and an ARB, it should be an ARB, which is preferable in that group of people. So if you still haven't managed to control the blood pressure, they're already on two drugs and you've checked the compliance and checked that they're taking it correctly, then you'd move on to add a third. Um, and so then they're going to be on all those three categories. So that would be a calcium channel blocker plus an ACE or an ARB plus a thiazide-like diuretic uh, such as indapamide. Um, if you get to the end of that and they still haven't got <laughs> controlled uh, blood pressure, then we move on to step four. Uh, when we would, uh, we're advised to use a low dose of spironolactone as long as the potassium level is 4.5 or less. Um, if the potassium is over 4.5, then NICE recommends using an alpha blocker or a beta blocker. Um, if you've got somebody on spironolactone as well as a thiazide diuretic and an ACE or an ARB, which you're going to at step four, then obviously you have to watch their renal function like a hawk. If you get to the end of all those steps, you've got people on four drugs and they're still not controlled, seek specialist advice. These guidelines do represent a pragmatic compromise, which hopefully allows us to treat blood pressure, high blood pressure successfully. I hope you found this short film helpful. Uh, the secret to success is definitely working with the person that you're trying to treat. Thank you.